People tend to say that migration to Ireland is a new thing, <coughs> that Ireland was never an immigration destination, which is entirely untrue. Over the years, waves of migrants, you had Celts and Normans and Huguenots and whatever, you know. However, in the, um, in the last 20 years or so, there's been accelerated migration, which was un disproportionate to other EU states because Ireland simply became prosperous. Ireland also portrayed itself as um, 100,000 welcomes, and people very often took it literally, you know, so they'd have them welcome here. Uh, but very more kind of um, specifically, it, most of the uh, reasons were economic reasons. People uh, thought they could find a place, a place to work, better life, and so on and so forth. Even asylum seekers, who people tend to forget are also migrants, um, decided to seek asylum in Ireland because it seemed like welcoming and prosperous. But even when we talk about kind of quantities of migrants, we still are talking about reasonably small numbers. We forget also that the largest group of migrants in Ireland are British. Nobody talks about them. Uh, many EU migrants uh, who came here, many for lifestyle reasons, many for, you know, work reasons. And what is important is that when the Celtic Tiger was at its highest, Ireland needed labour in order to keep the economy going. They needed people for both dirty jobs, but also for professional jobs. To this day, uh, there's a shortage of both nurses and doctors, and people are imported as migrant doctors and migrant nurses because Irish nurses and Irish doctors tend to emigrate uh, because they can't get the job. Now, why this exactly, I'm not entirely sure, but still you have a situation of both push and pull because many of these people come from situations of poverty, many of persecution, many of just, you know, um, not quite poverty, but uh, a situation where work is not uh, that good. Po mon many Poles talk about the workplace being <coughs> very hierarchical as opposed to Ireland, which is more easygoing. Um, so there's always a push and the pull situation, uh, factors in migration, but still we're talking about reasonably small numbers. Ireland is still very underpopulated, you know, if you think of it. You know, I come from Israel, Palestine, etc. Um, in an area which is with the Palestinian territory is a quarter of the size of Ireland. There's 10 million people, okay? Munster, 10 million. Ireland, 4 million. So we have some proportion there. You know, it's still underpopulated, still room for people. Yet there's a panic because of the history of unemployment, the history of immigration, which is coming to haunt us yet again. When the Irish economy needed migrants as labor, uh, they were constructed as necessary, as positive, etc. But the majority of these migrants were white people. And this is something which nobody talks about very much. Uh, for instance, when um, the government went to recruit in South Africa, it was mostly white people who had been recruited. Um, there, were, there was a need for people, okay, to keep things going. Many people worked in, in service jobs. To this day, even though unemployment is high, even though migration is high, in many service jobs such as cleaning <coughs> and hospitality, the majority of workers tend to be migrants from Eastern Europe. They're white, they're Catholic. They are presentable, even though the English is not always great, and you often hear people say, well, I can't understand what this waitress has said. You know what I mean? But, but basically, I think there was a need, and that these people were constructed as necessary for our standard of living. However, there's a whole type of other migrants, people from non-EU countries, particularly black people, and many of them came as asylum seekers, a completely legal category. People are entitled by law to seek, to seek asylum, but many people tend to forget about them. They weren't necessary for the economy, and indeed they were not allowed to work. <clears throat> Therefore, they're seen as a burden on the economy, even though if they had been allowed to work, there would have been a bon bonus to the economy. Many of the, the ones have got refugee status have open businesses. They have, they're contributing in ways, even if they don't get jobs, they still pay taxes. So we have a kind of bizarre circular argument here. <clears throat> we also have visible migrants and invisible migrants, and it's not surprising that the invisible ones tend to be black, even though they're physically very visible on our streets, <clears throat> in our schools, in hospitals, etc. So there is a kind of, not surprising, but this sort of dichotomy. It's very important too to remember that Ireland for many years saw itself and not possible, it's not possible for Irish people to be racist because after all we've been racialized for all these years. But unfortunately, 
we learned being racist very fast. We also have learned being racist in the country, we, the Irish, because I'm not Irish, um, learned to be racist in <coughs> the country of our dias diaspora. Uh, the Irish very much became white in the United States a short time after a riot as really miserable, blackish sort of migrants after the famine. And we know that they became um, <coughs> sided with the um, slaveholders and not the abolitionists, for instance, in the United States. There's some good work on that. So this fiction that Irish people can't be racist, in fact, indeed is a fiction. So the distinction between individual and institutional racism is slightly artificial. Yes, people can be individually racist, but by and large, the issue is the state. Because the state is the only factor or the only body that has the power to actually exclude and include in, racially, in racial terms. David Theo Goldberg, on whose work I, I rely a lot, says that all modern nation states are racial states who exclude and in include in, racially, in racial terms. And Ireland is not different. Ireland is not more racist than other countries. Because when I say Ireland is racist or racial, people say, yes, what about South Africa? Ireland is not more or less racist. Ireland is a nation state which constructed the Irish people as a Gaelic Catholic people and in the process of it excluded lots of people to start Irish, Irish Protestants, many of whom fled the country after independence. But over the years, there was a, a tendency to strengthen Irish identity as Gaelic and Catholic. In the course of that, people who didn't fit were excluded. And this is what the state does. And it does it in all sorts of ways. But at the mo ways at the moment, it does it particularly through its immigration policies and integration policies as well. Integration supposedly is aimed at those people who came. Until people have the narrative, or until these people came, Ireland was not racist. They supposedly bring racist powder in the suitcases. Racism was not, was not here, but the experience of Jewish people during the war, between 1933 and 1946, only 60 Jewish refugees were allowed into Ireland, which was neutral, and these people were being burnt. And one of the things that was said by Minister Boland was that if we allow too many Jews in, there will be anti-Semitism. Again, Jews obviously carry anti-Semitism powder in the, in the suitcase. So it's, there, is, there are historical precedents. And, and um, to speak of Ireland as a racial state is, is not insulting, particularly more so than to speak about ra uh, Germany or, or France or England as, as racial states. And importantly too, Ireland has always exercised racist policies towards its own largest ethnic minority, the Irish travelers, who are prevented from even the status of a, an ethnic minority. But clearly various policies directed the travelers have been uh, racially constructed. And this is no doubt. I mean, people, the government would say, but they are like us. Okay, tell us when they can't get a job or when they, when they can't get into school or when people burn them out of their houses that they're just like us. I has accepted that large groups of so-called program refugees. People were invited to Ireland to stay here. Their experiences were not particularly good. The Chileans were housed in, a, in, a, in an army barrack somewhere. I think they, they, they had an, a hunger strike and eventually left the country. Uh, the Baha'is fared better. They stayed and are very grateful to the state. The Vietnamese were OK, but I think their situation is not that great. Many of them still work in the catering industry, many of them as workers, not as owners. Uh, the second generation is more Irish, but they didn't have a smooth. The Bosnians um, had um, quite a, a kind of a zigzag sort of career. They were supposedly integrated, but they, they, and I have a student who just completed a PhD on that, they never felt they were fully part of Ireland. And when it was possible, they started going home for the summer, and they lived between Bosnia and Ireland. So they're not really they don't feel really part of Ireland. And I think even the young generation tend to go back home at least for part of the year. So the, the integration of even those people who were invited was only partial. The Kosovar, as we know, were invited, but only for a limited period, and they were sent back. Now, there are other groups of refugees, those who came to seek asylum. I think there were 39 who came in the first year that they were counted. I think it was 1993. 
the peak at 11,600 in 2001, I think. I can't remember exactly. But basically, we're talking about altogether something like 70,000 people. Not a huge number. Yet, they were always treated differently. At the beginning, they were allowed to live, um, to, to rent um, accommodation, and they lived in town and were able to organize. In fact, one of the most important associations that that they um, started what was called ARASI, Association of Refugees and Asylum Seekers in Ireland, and they organized publicly to, to highlight the cause. But in 2000, the REC provision brought in, and this is one policy of differentiation, categorization, and exclusion that the government brought in, in the wake of Britain, of course, because all uh, Ireland, uh, Ireland's uh, migration policies are in the wake of Britain because of the previous, previous common travel area. Uh, and uh, and um, direct provision has really cut cut refugees off, isolated them. The direct provision hostels are very bad, and I know you've done a program on that, so you know some something about it. The bad bad place to live. Many people are there for more than seven years, and basically what we kind of call it, we call it state of de uh, sites of deportability. It's a place where people are always ready to be deported deportable people. The, the GNRB can go and, and pick people up from, from these places. They get a very small allowance, they get bed and board, usually food they really don't like and can't eat. Their children are often harassed. There they, they really is not a way to live. They're not allowed to work or to take third level education. So basically you, you, you kind of put a population there outside of, out, out, the, out beyond the view of Irish society and you completely, in a way, racialize them. They're not, not all black, of course. Many of them were, in a, in, a, in, a, in a past, Eastern European, although now many of these countries have got EU status. But the point is that these, this is one way of racializing a whole group of people. At the moment, there's not that many left in the direct provision because many have been deported. Some have been given a, a leave to remain or refugee status, but the rate of Ireland's recognition of, of refugees is very low, the lowest in the EU. In fact, uh, which the, uh, where the average is 27 percent, the Irish uh, um, average is six percent. Okay, so so this is one way of racializing migrants. But another very important turning point to me was the citizenship referendum of 2004, where an old law, according to which everybody who bo was born in a, in a in a island of Ireland <coughs> was entitled to automatic Irish citizenship. Um, Women and parents were coming and having babies here, according to the government, deliberately in order to get Irish citizenship. And they, according to uh, the the Fadrigiano, um, um, Supreme Court case, were allowed leave to remain to look after the children. At some point, the government said, enough is enough. We don't want all these people to come here and get Irish citizenship. Therefore, we'll change the law on citizenship. And they reversed the 83 years old law and citizenship. After that, only people born in the island of Ireland, whose, one of whose parents is a citizen or entitled to citizenship, will get Irish citizenship. At the same time, there's a large number of um, third and fourth generation Irish people who live in America, who never set foot in Ireland, who are entitled to Irish citizenship. So you have here a weird combination of both a blood-based citizenship <coughs> and a, a complete a racialization of a group of people who had children here in a complete uh, naive belief that, uh, that um, uh, they went the children would be entitled to citizenship. And interestingly enough, the government put the blame on the mothers <coughs> and said mothers were coming here pregnant and deliberate and all the rest of it. So much so, the government began to believe their own spin. I was on a show with uh, Mihor Martin, then he was Minister for Health, or he was Minister for Commerce then, but he had been Minister for Health. <coughs> in the commercial break, it was question and answered. He told me, I know a Nigerian woman who had quintuplets. She had the first one in Nigeria, and she hopped on the plane and had the other four in Ireland. And I said to him, do you actually hear what you're saying? And he said, yes, 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 I really think that uh, travel companies should not allow these people on the plane. Now, I debated when I came back on the air whether I'll say it on air, because I, I decided not to, because I thought if I did, there will be people who will believe it out there. But how, how can a man 
believe in the spin. And recently I met him. Last year I met him in some family do in Cork. And I reminded him and he said, yes, a doctor wrote a letter to me and told me this was true. The man still believed in his spin. So the government really thought there was a danger here to the integrity of Irish citizenship, to the integrity of Irishness itself. And it managed to convince the population that this indeed was the case. Racializing a whole slew of people um, and, and, and turning them into welfare tourists, citizenship tourists, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So this is, these are some examples of how the government, and nobody else can do it. It doesn't matter if Joe Bloggs shouts nigger or, or paki. The point is the government can actually make the laws to racialize groups of people, to not allow them to come to this country. Now, what happened was bizarre, because according to the Good Friday Agreement, people born on the island of Ireland are still part of the Irish nation. So you have people born in the island of Ireland, they're part of the Irish nation, but they're not citizens. A bit strange, yeah. being part of the nation and not being citizen. Now, I've got Irish citizenship many years, Am I part of the Irish nation? I don't think so, but I have Irish citizenship for many years. So it's kind of weird, you know, not worked through to the end, but ultimately and unconsciously defending Irish white superiority without calling it, you know, a racial supremacy. Let me start by saying that the current Minister for Justice is a grandchild of migrants. So in that respect, yes, he's having a good influence on social policy. But leave that aside. Um, no, in truth, migrants have no influence whatsoever. And this is part of the problem. There are lots of NGOs working on behalf of, of migrants, and many of them are excellent, but many of them actually want to reform bad laws rather than call for an end for bad things. For instance, people are saying deportations are all right because they're part of the a, a, a immigration policy, providing they're done humanely with consideration to human rights, it's okay. And this is what the Irish Refugee Council is saying, the Immigration Council of Ireland and others. However, ADI, which is Anti-Deportation Ireland, who I know you've talked to before, are saying deportation are not all right in any, in any circumstances. Now, I don't know, for me, it's, I, I haven't forgotten what my gran grandparents have undergone. My grandparents were refugees out of Romania. And there was a point, they luckily were saved from the camps that Romanian Jews were sent to during the Second World War, because they left on time. But their family wasn't saved. They were taken at dawn, or told by their neighbor, former neighbors, or neighbors, Christian neighbors, you're now going to this area. So the notion of deportation makes me entirely ill at ease. It's emotional, yes. But basically, I really do believe in an open door policy. I don't think Ireland will suffer that much. People say, but what will happen with employment and welfare and all the rest of it? You know, migrants are very plucky people. In fact, they are the stronger, the strongest of, of the group. There are people who can get it together, get enough money to travel, pay a, pay a smuggler, because you have to be smuggled, not trafficked, you have to be smuggled. Particularly when you, uh, I'm talking about the asylum seeker here. You have to undergo awful journeys. We did a piece of research on Somali refugees. Their journey through the desert, horrific. But they, they made it. They're strong people and they can contribute hugely to Irish society if they were allowed. Rather than saying these are, these are burdens, these costs. 